Good afternoon and welcome to this meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting and Maritime Uses. I am Council Member Adrian Adams, the Chair of this Subcommittee. Today we are joined by Council Members Ku, Salamanca, Traeger, and Jaeger. Today we will be hearing, we will be holding one public hearing and voting on three items. The items we will be voting on were heard at our April 17th meeting. We will be voting to approve LU 63, the application by ACS and DCAS for the acquisition of property located at 4917 Fourth Avenue in Council Member Menchaca's district in Brooklyn for the continued use as St. Andrew's Community Day Daycare Center. We will also be voting to approve LU 51, the application submitted by Montefiore Cemetery in Council Member Miller's district. Montefiore Cemetery seeks approval to use approximately two acres of land located across the street from the existing cemetery for additional burial space. We will also be voting on a bill related to this application proposed to intro 212A by Council Member Miller, a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to approval of cemetery uses on land acquired in Queens before 1973. This legislation is required to give effect to Mont Montefiore Cemetery's application. I will now call for a vote in accordance with the recommendations of the local council members to approve LUs 51 and 63 and proposed introduction number 212A. Council, please call the roll. Adams. Aye. Ku. Uh, <coughs> may I just make my, my roll? You may. Thank you. Uh, I I, I will vote uh, yes to the votes, but I propose in the future when we approve cemetery use uh, in New York City, uh, it must be non-discriminatory, -disc meaning that it must be open to all religious people, uh, people of any color, uh, because I don't believe you know, when we die, you know, we have to be segregated in the certain areas. You know? So because in the utopia, well, we all evil, you know, we all ashes after we die, and, we, and and the soul. So we should be allowed to bury wherever we are, can afford to buy. So that, that's my 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 concern is for the future. This time, I mean, it's too late to I mean, put in objections to it. But for the future, if we approve cemetery use in New York City Council, uh, New York City Council by New York City Council. We should consider that point. You know, we should be equal opportunity for everyone who want to buy that plot of land in particular cemetery. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Traeger. Aye. By a vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, the all items are approved and recommended to the full land use uh, committee. Thank you, Council. We will now move on to our public hearing, which is on introduction number 368 by Council Member Salamanca a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to authorizing the Landmarks Preservation Commission to administer a historic preservation grant program. LPC administers a historic preservation grant program funding by the Department of Housing and Urban Development's CDBG program. This program provides grants of 10,000 to 30,000 to owners of designated landmarks who are qualifying nonprofits and individuals. Until recently, LPC's website indicated that religious institutions were prohibited from participating in the program. This bill would authorize LPC to administer its historic preservation grant program using local, state, and federal funds, provided it does not discriminate against owners on the basis of their religious or non-religious character. To maintain consistency with the Landmarks Law, and to ensure that such grants do not violate the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. The bill would restrict the use of grant funds to the maintenance and preservation of exteriors of religious institutions and prohibit the use of such funds to maintain the interiors of spaces used for religious worship. I now recognize the bill's sponsor, Chair Salamanca. I want to thank you, uh, Chair Adams, and um, good morning, uh, good afternoon to everyone. I just want to talk a little bit about, just want to um, give a briefing on this bill and how it came to light. Uh, when I first got elected in 2016, one of the first tasks uh, that I had uh, was 
approving uh, the landmarks of a, uh, a church, uh, Immaculate Conception in my district, uh, which was built in the late 1800s. And um, I met with uh, landmarks, and I was in favor of landmarking it. It was a beautiful structure. And so I got a visit from the local pastor, uh, Father Skelly, uh, who is uh, community-oriented, and it's a staple in our community. And Father Skelly asked that this application be removed from being landmarked uh, because his parishioners are, are they're, they're, they don't come from wealth, and therefore the contributions that they give uh, to the church uh, was not something to what other more prominent communities are afforded to give. And his concern was that the building needed capital improvements, and landmarking the building was going to handcuff them uh, to put in capital improvements at a higher cost than they can afford. And so I, um, I told Father Skelly that I will support him and the Archdiocese on this request. However, we, have, we would have to come to some type of agreement because this was a beautiful building and it deserved to be landmarked. And so it took me two years, and after two years, we were able to get to a good place where we have a bill uh, that is, gives religious institutions the ability uh, to, um, to landmark their buildings but gives them that access to funding where they can fix the structure of the building and ultimately we can do what we are tasked to do, which is to preserve uh, that building. Uh, so I am extremely excited um, that we are finally here uh, to hear this uh, piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Salamanca. We will now call on our uh, panelists for the morning. Mark Silverman and Ms. Capehart, please step up. And Mr. Capehart. <laughs> uh, please raise your right hand and uh, please state your names. Please, please state Mark your name. Silverman. Guardia Capehart. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and in response to all council member questions? Do. I do. There we go. Um, good afternoon, chairs uh, Salamanca and Adams and, and members of the subcommittee. I am Mark Silberman, uh, general counsel of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. And with me today is Guardia Cathar, Budget Director for the Commission. We are here on behalf of Chair Srinivasan to provide testimony on Intro 368. The proposed legislation amends the Landmarks Law by adding a new section 25323 titled Historic Preservation Grant Program. This new section does two things. First, it authorizes the Commission to administer a grant program with local, state, or federal funds for the purpose of preserving designated and calendared buildings and interiors. Second, the bill prohibits the commission from discriminating against religious uh, entities as applicants for such grants and also uh, prohibits the commission from making grants for the preservation of interior rooms used for religious worship, instruction, or proselytization. As the council knows, since uh, 1977, the commission has administered a historic preservation grant program targeting low and moderate income homeowners along with not-for-profits to help restore or repair historic properties. During the first term of this administration from FY15 to FY17, we awarded just over $233,000 to eight um, applicants with another four awards for a total of $120,000 pending for FY18. These 12 awards came from an eligible pool of 14 uh, applicants. We welcome applica applications from all not-for-profits and property owners who need assistance restoring or repairing historic properties. The existing grant program is funded by the Federal Community Development Block Grant Program, which is administered by the United States Department of Housing uh, and Urban Development. HUD sets specific guidelines and other restrictions for CDBG eligibility. For instance, a household of, of four may earn up to $83,450 to be eligible for a grant, and our testimony provides a, uh, uh, 
a graph of those kinds of um, uh, restrictions. Applica appli applicants above these income levels may also be eligible for a grant, provided they are able to put forward a 10 to 50 percent matching contribution. For instance, a four-person household putting forward 50 percent of a project's cost may collectively earn no more than $104,300 for their application to be eligible for the grant program. Additionally, if the property is being used for rental housing, tenants must be paying an affordable rent. In New York City, this is defined as paying either uh, less than or equal to 30% of the household's adjusted gross income or equal to less uh, or equal to or less than the fair market rent for that type of unit as established by HUD for the New York City area, and those kind of rental guidelines are also included in our testimony. Similarly, for not-for-profits that own historic properties must either be providing a benefit to low- and moderate-income persons or an area, or the property must be determined to the, uh, de must be detrimental, excuse me, to the public's health and safety. The not-for-profit must also be organized under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code. However, however, federal regulations are ambiguous as to what types of projects may qualify for the grant program when the property is being used for religious purposes. In February 2018, the Commission and the New York City Office of Management and Budget wrote to HUD asking for clarity on when and with what conditions CDBG funds may be used to rehabilitate properties that are being used for religious purposes. We are happy to share HUD's response once we receive it. In closing, we appreciate the spirit that underlies Intro 368, and we hope to have your support as we continue to work with HUD to understand what types of projects may qualify for historic preservation grants at properties being used for religious purposes. As an agency that regulates and works frequently with property owners, we are sensitive to the added responsibility that owning a landmark property comes with. For this reason, we, are, we work closely with owners to provide free technical expertise and assistance for when applicants seek to make changes to a property. We are also currently working on a series of rule changes that would promote preservation by making the application process for work more efficient and less costly. The Archdiocese of New York and, Arch and Diocese of Brooklyn testified in favor of the changes on behalf of the Catholic Church, which owns over 140 landmark structures throughout the five boroughs. Uh, we are also proud that under this administration, the city has been a strong supporter of federal and state tax credits for the rehabilitation of historic properties, which were, are, which were at risk in the recent budget cycles. On behalf of the Commission, we thank you for allowing us to testify today and are happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Mr. Silverman, uh, LPC's website for its CDBG-funded uh, historic preservation grant program once stated that buildings used for religious purposes were ineligible for grants. LPC re recently changed its website to state that federal regulations may restrict the use of CDBG funds for such buildings. Is LPC currently accepting grant applications from religious institutions? And if so, what is it doing with those applications? We are currently accepting grant applications from any uh, eligible not-for-profit. Um, we are uh, waiting. We have not awarded any grants. We are waiting to see, to get a response from HUD to see what restrictions and how we can properly, you know, uh, apply those funds to uh, religious uh, applicants. Thank you. You've referenced in your testimony uh, a wait on HUD. Is there any, is there any response as far as follow-up or a time frame from them at this point? Um, we, we have not heard of any. Um. Okay. How many houses of worship have been landmarked to date? Um, well, it, it's an interesting question. Um, there are a 400, approximately 490 um, buildings used and owned by religious entities um, for, uh, that have been designated, and that includes both individual landmarks and buildings within the districts, and that's buildings. Um, specifically, houses of worship, um, uh, our database shows that there's 319. Okay. Now, you've mentioned in your testimony that LPC landmarks interior uh, portions of houses of worship only. Exteriors. H exterior, I'm sorry. Exterior. How does or can LPC ensure that grant funds will not be used to improve interior spaces used for worship? Well, Grants are, are uh, awarded for specific work. 
and we have a grant, our grant program staff is very, very involved in these grant applications. Uh, we are working with the contractors, uh, we are working with the specifications. So, um, you know, we're very, uh, we monitor closely the, the scope of work that's happening. So, that, that's the way we would know that it's not being used. And what types of restoration work are typical of religious institutions that are different from non-religious institutions, and how do those differences affect the costs of maintenance? Well, religious buildings tend, and not always, but tend to be, you know, robust, fairly robust masonry buildings uh, with ornamental, you know, designs on the outside. So, in that sense, they, they tend to be, uh, a lot of the cost has to be masonry repair and restoration. Um, to the extent that, that uh, sculptural detail and other kinds of ornamental detail need to be uh, addressed, uh, they can be more expensive for that reason. And has the city ever authorized the use of expense or capital funds for, his, for historic preservation? For historic preservation? For historic preservation. Of, of religious? Has the city ever authorized the use of expense or capital funds for historic preservation? Religious institution. Um, do you want to yeah. answer that? So uh, for, um, for the grant program, uh, there's been, there has been one grant awarded uh, to um, the uh, congregation of the Sheriff Israel, that was for the uh, cemetery wall, and so that that grant was uh, approved because it wasn't for um, religious purposes. The cemetery, obviously, uh, the wall is you know it was to prevent slime, uh, slum and bloody conditions, and also to protect the public safety. Uh, so the commission, the grant program approved that grant. Unfortunately, the uh, the uh, the congregation withdrew that application because they didn't proceed with the project. But that's the only time where the grant program, where the, L the LPP Historic Preservation Grant Program awarded a grant to uh, an entity, uh, a, a religious institution. Um, as far as the city as a whole, uh, we can speak to that. Um, that's something that we can check with OMB or another, uh, because Landmarks also does not have a capital budget. So that's another thing too. So if, it, so if there was any capital funding approved for any project, that's something that Landmarks does not uh, uh, has uh, oversight of. Okay, thank you. I may have some questions at the end. I will now turn it over to Chair Salamanca for questions. Sure. Thank you, uh, Chair Adams. Thank you for your statement. Um, really excited. And I want to thank you, Bob, for the help that your uh, agency has given us in putting together uh, this. Uh, this proposed bill. How much funding will be allocated to this grant for uh, for these types of institutions? Will it be separate from the um, grants that households are eligible for, or this is all the same pot? Uh, it's all the same uh, pot. Uh, every year we get an allocation of $115,000 per year uh, for the grant program. And that's for both residential properties and for nonprofit uh, properties owned by nonprofits. I don't think that's enough. If we pass this grant, you know, if we pass this piece of legislation. Um, all right. My next question was going to be: Will it interfere with the community uh, development block grant programs? And I guess you answered that it is. It will, because it's all in the same pot. Correct. It's all coming from the same pot. So the grant program funding is all in one pot for both the residential and the uh, for nonprofits. So if we were to get an application from a religious entity, that will, that will be from that same pot if, if, if that application was approved. At the preliminary budget hearings, I remember there was concerns that the yearly $115,000 that was allocated was not being used on an annual basis. And that was being rolled over. Where where does that money go? Let's say this year you only use eighty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. Where does that extra fifteen thousand go? So that money is in a in a general CDBG uh, funding pool that comes to the city. That is managed by the Office of Management and Budget (OMB). Uh, so for whenever there's underspending in one area, so the lamp our history preservation grant program being one area of that. If there's underspending in one area, OMB has the ability uh, to transfer funding to another area that will need additional funding, uh, which would be another, it could be another city agency. But within LPC, um, if that money is not spent, um, that's something that is left up to OMB to decide how it's spent. 
but that's not money that goes back to the federal government. Now that we're so, so just yes. so it's clear, so so if money is unspent, two two different things can happen. One is that uh, we roll it over for use in the next year, uh, or if there's the, also the option, I guess, that OMB can take that money and then use it for other uh, eligible CDBG you know activities by other agencies. So the first option is the ideal option, but that's not what's occurring. So it's occurring. So the way the way that option works is that in order for us to roll over uh, funding to the next fiscal year, it has to be funding that was allocated for a project that has not finished yet. So if it's something, if it's funding that was already allocated to a grant project that was approved, and that work has not been completed before the end of the fiscal year, we have the ability to roll the funding over to the next fiscal year for that project that is already been allocated for to complete that project. But funding that has not been allocated for a specific project because we don't have uh, uh, the, um, we don't have a, a lot of applicants that qualify for the grant program that got approved for a grant. That funding is something that is in the hands of OMB. What's the dollar amount that has been rolled over to OMB from this pot? So there are two different in things. In the last five years. So there are two different things in terms of uh, o now OMB. So when it comes to rollover, it's not rollover to OMB. Rolling over means it's staying within LPC. I, I but understand. Yes. But OMB, the OMB agency is responsible for managing that pot of money. Yeah, money that's not spent by LPC, yes. In the last five years, how much money from uh, this grant has I not been provide. spent? I, c I can provide that information to you uh, later, I can, in, later on. I can get the numbers for you later on. Uh, and my concern is, again, I'm really excited about this piece of legislation, but um, I feel that the $115,000 is not enough. Should now other religious institutions realize, hey, I qualify for this, um, and I, I want to do now capital improvements to my building, and landmarks will turn around and say, oh, wait a minute, we've met our bench, we've met our, our, our cap in terms of what we're allowed to spend annually when in the last five years there's a, a dollar amount, which we don't know, and you'll get back to us, but should be readily available to everyone now that we're opening up to a more broader uh, audience. I just want to point out, uh, Council Member, that as far as um, the, uh, the funding that is available to LPC, Whenever, if we are ever in a position where we have a lot of, we have qualified grant applicants coming that meet the grant requirements and we need additional funding, that door is open to us to go back to OMB to ask for additional funding. In the last few years, we haven't had that experience. That's why this, so that's why the amount we have uh, that comes in every year is based on what we've spent over the past years. So if there's an uptick in uh, the number of qualified applications that we receive, and we do, uh, we review this application and the award or grant and we need additional funding, we have the ability to go back to OMB to seek additional funding. We haven't been able to do that because- It hasn't happened had because you haven't used it we all. Haven't now, used it all, exactly. how are, are we you have, sure? But I just want to point out that we have given grants to almost every, uh, you know, eligible applicant. So, yeah, so we are- Yeah, and now you're opening, you're opening up the door to other applicants, yeah. which, is, which is exciting. Um, I just really want to know what's the dollar amount, I, you know, and I'm surprised you don't have that available uh, because if someone owes, an agency is owed money, they normally know off the top of the head, this agency owes me X amount of dollars. So re please, let's get that information. Is it possible sure. you can get that information while we're still having this hearing? Because uh, I know some of my colleagues will have questions. I think, sure. I think it's possible. I, you can call <laughs> someone and send them a text, right? Uh, I cannot confirm that, but... Uh, it has to be someone that you can text and can go into a database and say, OMB is holding X amount of dollars yeah, yeah. from us. Yeah. Um, so please, uh, get me that information. Um, now, are all houses of worship eligible for this grant? Again, theoretically, there's the, every, every house of worship is elig eligible. The, the issue that we've reached out to HUD for clarification about is what type of work and under what circumstances and with what limitations would come with um, the grant. So, you know, there are different, and I know that I think the, the HUD letter has been shared with the committee, and, and there's lots of different iterations of that, and we're waiting for clarification because it really depends on what, how the property is being used and um, what, the, what the proposed work um, is being applied for. When a private homeowner or a non-for-profit 
who's eligible for the community development block grant, when they apply, they're, they have to meet certain income thresholds. Will there be an income threshold for religious institutions? There are certain more prominent communities in my district who have the funds to, uh, to put in for capital improvements uh, versus religious institutions in my district who, Immaculate Conception, the example, who ask not to be landmarked because their contributions that they get from their parishioners uh, will not meet the needs to, 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 to fix what needs to be addressed. So will you, how, how would you balance this out? Uh, so to clarify regarding the nonprofit organizations that apply for grant, it's not based on, because a nonprofit organization is not based on income, it's based on the services they provide. So when it comes to nonprofit organizations, we look at uh, whether they provide uh, uh, benefits to low, moderate income persons on area. So it's not based on income because it's a nonprofit organization, it's based on what services they provide. So the CDBG uh, funding will go toward, uh, again, if it's something where that, that, that community where they're in, for, and then one example is if it's, a, if it's a synagogue or a church that has a shelter or a soup kitchen for homeless people, the activities that, that they provide is what qualifies them for CDBG funding, not an income of the, uh, the organization because it's a nonprofit organization. I would like to have more of a discussion on this um, because I, I understand that they may be providing similar services to, to a, a, a not-for-profit or a place of worship, but I think it, the, the whole purpose of this grant is to allow low-income communities that have these um, buildings that should be landmarked to be landmarked and giving them the, the means necessary to fix or address what needs to be addressed in terms of capital improvements versus a not-for-profit who's doing similar work, but they're in a more prominent community and they have bigger contributions from their parishioners compared to low-income communities. Um, with that, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. Uh, just one more question for myself. What is your anticipated increase in applications? Um, in terms of Do you? Oh, you mean in terms, in terms of the uh, uh, religious yes. institutions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you expect an increase, a substantial increase? Well, we can say for sure uh, in terms of uh, what we can expect on it because it's based on uh, needed need repairs um, as far as uh, religious institutions for now like even with the uh, the change in our in our grant uh, the language on our website we haven't received any applications for any re religious institutions as of yet okay. um, so I really can say so you haven't really seen any any movement, any movement in, in the area yet okay yet. okay thank you um, we'll now go to questions from from uh, my colleagues, I will ask for the Sergeant at Arms to give us a five minutes on the clock. Uh, questions, first questions coming from Councilmember Koo. Uh, first of all, I, I, I would say uh, I support this bill. Uh, it's a very good bill from Chair Samalanka. Uh, the, the question I have for, for the, from the administration is the, uh, the grant money is too small, $150,000, you know. $150, you know? I mean, it costs more than a million dollars to build a pepper bathroom, you know, in any part, you know, not even more than a million dollars, like two million dollars to build a pepper. And landmarking, fixing landmarking building is very expensive. You have to hire architects, you have to hire special like, people to do it, uh, to draw a plan. So this is, mine's too small. I think administration should put in more money uh, to support this uh, grant. The second question is, um, uh, you said uh, religious institutions uh, may not get uh, grant money from because of federal regulations. So can they use a, a surrogate? Like say I have a, a church has a, another non-profit group called say uh, Friends for St. George Church. You know, can they apply instead of the church? A surrogate organization. Like like a church, like a big church, they might they can form a another 
It's the Friends of uh, St. Yep. Anthony Church, right? And they are a non-profit group. So if they cannot go into the church directly, can, the, can this non-profit organization apply the grant money in sense of the church apartment? So they, uh, they, the owners apply, but also want to point out that it's based on the use of the property. Uh, the application for, uh, for our grant program is based on use for the property. So even if it's a, another organization that is applying, we still look at what property the work is being proposed for, uh, and we look at uh, what that property is being used for. So it's not, it's not like the grant program is discriminating against uh, a church or someone that is accepting applications from churches. It all depends on that structure for which the application is being submitted. We want to know, we look at the purpose for which that structure is being used. And that's how uh, they, uh, we determine whether that, uh, in, that, in, that property qualifies for a grant program. Like you said before, most churches are not only religious organizations now. They do a lot of service, like uh, soup kitchen, homeless, uh, uh, after school programs, all these things. Exactly, and we accept, and so we 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 will be we accept applications from from all those institutions. So if a church that has one of those activities or more more of those activities apply for a grant uh, from our grant program, we accept those application and review, and we look at what the purpose of the grant is. You know, we look at what work they're looking to do on the property for which they're applying for a grant. And that is what uh, uh, the uh, qualification is based on. So the quali qualification is based on what activities are being done at the property um, and what, what the property is being used for. So that's what we look at. So, so how many pages is your application for applying to such a grant? Is it a big, 100 page? Or? Two, it's a two page, it's a two page application. Two page application? Two page form, okay. exactly. So, and then how long it takes you to approve usually? Well, so the, typically we receive applications through the course of the year, and uh, we have a board, the, uh, the grant program board, that meets to review applications in the fall, so it would depend on what time of the year uh, the, uh, the application is received. So for instance, uh, our board usually meets uh, in the fall, so that's around September to October of the year. So if we got a grant uh, application that came in, say July or August, that application will be reviewed by the full board uh, in September, October and a decision is made on what they are awarded for a grant. But I also want to point out that the first step is we have a grant uh, team, a staff that reviews the application initially uh, to ensure that it meets the HUD requirements. And as long as it meets the HUD requirements, we let them know that uh, they have met the initial requirements and will be forwarding the application on to the board for, uh, for review and approval. And if it's, a, if it's a, a, an application that came in that does not meet the initial minimum requirement, then we'll let them know that it didn't meet that requirement without waiting to go to our board. So we could respond to them within a week or two weeks. Uh, and if it's something that's going to, to the board, they will just wait for um, maybe a month or two until the board meets and decides on what grants are being awarded. So what is the average amount you grant? The average, uh, you mean the dollar amount? Yeah, the dollar amount, yeah. Uh, so our grants range anywhere between ten to $30,000. Rec in recent years, we've been giving grants mostly around $25,000 to $30,000 um, per project. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Chen. Thank you, Council Member. Are there any, Council Member Yeager? <coughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, I, I wish to associate myself with uh, Councilman Cruz comments. I think the grant program is too low. Uh, a number of months ago on the Florida Council, I voted against uh, the landmarking of a premises known as the Huberty House, I believe, in, uh, in Bushwick, uh, because the owner uh, disapproved of what I viewed as an unconstitutional taking uh, in violation of the Fifth Amendment. Um, a landmarking of a property is a taking because it puts up all kinds of brick walls to what the property owner can then go about and do to his or her property. Um, more so, of course, with a nonprofit, which has far limited funds. Uh, an owner of a property can simply wants to do more work, doesn't have enough money, get another job. Uh, church can't really go and do that. Um, so I do agree that the program should be a little more, but I, I'd like to focus a little bit on the uh, question about, or the statement that you made with regard to the HUD regulations. And as I understand it, uh, and as I believe you've described, uh, HUD regulations don't actually prohibit it. They just they don't speak in favor of it, they don't speak against it, they don't care, they don't say. And so my question is, because that was a statement, my question is, what stops you right now um, from giving a grant to a church? Well, I think, um, <coughs> Council Member, 
you know, the, the issue for, for us is, is, again, not necessarily the eligibility, but the HUD does have guidance documents that sets forth and, and you know, in certain formulas and things like that. And so we want to be sure that when we, if we were to uh, give a grant, that it would be in full compliance with the federal guidelines. And so that's why we've asked for specific guidance, giving them sort of different scenarios, just so we truly understand and are good stewards of this federal money and use it in a proper way. What if they never answer you? Well, I don't think we would have any expectation they would never answer. We, we, su we submitted, um, well, I mean, I think we, we would deal with that, I suppose, uh, after a long delay and, and continued uh, requests. But we don't expect that. I think the, the city has good relationships with HUD, and we would expect them to give us answers. I mean, it's a very reasonable request. Okay. And the regulation that you uh, that you referenced uh, um, uh, that is ambiguous, I think you spoke about the ambiguity, the ambiguity of it, part five of the HUD regulations, uh, say faith-based organizations are eligible on the same basis as any other organization to participate in HUD programs and activities. Um, uh, that we're get not getting that from you, we're getting that from uh, our learned counsel who work here at this august body. Um, that seems to be a very broad statement, but it also seems to me that says that, you know, if, some, if an organization is faith-based, owns a piece of property, applies for a grant program that relies on HUD money, no reason that uh, the, gr the faith-based organization should not be eligible to receive that grant money. You're so you're, you're relying on ambiguity, but it, this seems to me to be quite unambiguous. Well, um, council member, I would just sort of say, you know, I think it's, we need to, uh, it's useful perhaps to back up a, se a second. The Landmarks Commission certainly would be, you know, uh, pleased to, to award grants to religious organizations. We work very closely with religious organizations uh, and have for throughout our tenure. We work closely with them to make sure that they can meet the needs they, they have for dealing with practical repairs to their buildings. Um, we're very sensitive to the fact that, that many of these um, entities have, have small congregations and are of limited funds. And so we, at a staff level, we have, we have a dedicated staff person that works uh, primarily and solely with religious organizations um, to the commission itself. When these things, uh, in the rare case where they do come forward, we, you know, the commissioners have, uh, you know, expressed and indicate and approve all sorts of very practical solutions to particular problems. So um, we certainly have uh, no, uh, we want to be able to give money. We want to, to provide money to eligible applicants. We just want to make sure that we're doing it in a way in full compliance with federal regulations. Same here. Um, the church that uh, my colleague spoke about, the Immaculate Conception, um, in his district, uh, you know, one of the things that I found fascinating on the houses of worship question uh, for landmarking is that uh, the houses of worship that are likely in most need of uh, protection and repair of their of their uh, very aging uh, premises are usually the oldest, well, obviously the oldest, but usually the smaller ones in neighborhoods where they're not necessarily getting the kind of financial support that they did when they were built a hundred and change years ago. So. It, this is usually uh, relatively poor neighborhoods um, that have these tremendous uh, buildings that uh, are historic, if not uh, with your stamp of approval, but surely throughout the course, I'm just gonna go on for a little second, Madam Chair, um, uh, throughout the course of history. Now, so um, I would urge you to uh, take a broader reading uh, than a more narrow reading because uh, as I read, you know, and I'm not the wisest lawyer, the wiser ones are employed by the council, I'm just a small country lawyer and recovering lawyer, I think we call it. Um, but the, 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 pro the prohibition, if you will, that you're inflicting, I don't want to use that word inflicting, but that you're imposing on, uh, on nonprofits is not really written in HUD regulations at all. And I, in my estimation, if we can go out tomorrow morning and give out a grant, and I agree with Council Member Cree, we need more money to do so, but in my estimation, you can give out a grant to a nonprofit that is a religious house uh, in order to preserve its landmark uh, uh, premises in the city of New York. And I don't think that anything should stop you. I would urge you not to wait for HUD to get back to you and to start working to implement something like that now. Thank you. Thank you, Council Thank Member. you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'd like to thank our panelists for your testimony today. Thank you very much. You may sit down.
Okay, we're gonna call up. Uh, Regarding the, the dollar amount that was uh, unspent over the last three fiscal years, they add up to uh, fifty-five thousand dollars. The three fiscal years, uh, the last Unspense? three fiscal years. Unspent, not Unspent. spent. So that you asked about. Thousand last yeah, that was not spent. Okay, for the last three fiscal years. Make sure you get that money back. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's that's. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, so just want to clarify, that's money that was not spent by LPC. So that's money that was uh, up to the uh, the Office of Management and Budget to spend in other CD eligible areas that require funding, not with LPC. So you, in the last three years, there was a total of fifty-five thousand dollars for mm -hmm. three years combined mm -hmm. that was sent back. N to uh, another pot that O and B runs. So that's that's money that was left in the general yeah in the general pool that O and B determines how that money gets reallocated. But that's money that LPC did not spend. If I understand your question was how much of our grant program money over the last few years we did not spend. So it was fifty five thousand dollars over the last three years that we did not spend. Does uh, does O and B in return if they spend that money um, reach out? To your agency and say, hey, no, that's we not spent something. this money. They don't. No, that's they not don't inform that's you. That's not something. That's OMB. They manage uh, the the OMB CD unit manages the CDBG funding for all citywide agencies. They allocate to respective agencies based on the CD programs that each city, each agency has. And so, if an agency in our case doesn't spend um, all of our CD funding, OMB gets to determine where it's reallocated, but don't come back to us and tell us where it was reallocated. That's up to OMB to determine. And, and I find that a little disheartening because this is not money that the city got from its taxpayers. This is grant money that they got from the federal government. And for OMB to just automatically this money go back to this fund and they have, uh, how can I say, you know, within their, their rules, they can just allocate that money where they choose without See. reaching back out to you and saying this is how we spent money that the federal government sent your agency. Uh, council member, just to clarify, uh, OMB, that's the, the city office of management and budget. I know who they are. No, no, I know and who they are. So they manage the grant, they manage the CDBG funding that the city receives from the federal government. So they have the oversight of that, uh, of that uh, pool of funding, not the individual agency. So each individual agency, depending on what CDBG program they have, get allocated a certain amount by OMB. Now, if there's underspending in one area, in another city agency, OMB has the ability to reallocate funding to another city CDBG uh, program. So the money is not going back to the federal government. It's still being spent. No, I, I, know, I, I know the, mo the money, but yeah. your agency is not making a decision as to where that money is being spent. OMB is making that decision. Yes. And I'm just curious to know how do they make that decision? What criteria do they use? And... Um, this yeah, is that's for another that's conversation. Yeah, that's something for yeah, that's something that OMB. Can you have. should have access to this money. OMB should not be reallocating this funding elsewhere. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'd like to ask uh, Joseph Rosenberg and Colleen Hemeyer, please step up. Good afternoon. Please state your name for the record. Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Joseph Rosenberg. I'm Colleen Hemeyer. Thank you very much. You may begin. Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair Adams, Salamanca, Ku, and uh, Council Member Yeager. I'm Joseph Rosenberg, Director of the Catholic Community Relations Council, representing the Archdiocese of New York. <coughs> and the Diocese of Brooklyn on local legislative and policy issues. I am here in strong support of Intro 368, which authorizes LPC to create a historic preservation grant program. This measure, if passed, would establish a program to provide much needed resources for owners to preserve their landmark properties. It would especially be helpful to religious organizations which do not receive public monies for the restoration and repair of their landmark structures. The Catholic Church owns over 145 landmark structures and buildings located in historic districts throughout the five boroughs, more than any property owner in our city. Although the goals of historic preservation are endorsed by the Catholic Church in New York City, 
the cost to maintain and renovate churches, schools, and rectories, many of them over 100 years old, is enormous. Preserving ecclesiastical architecture, which contains intricate carved stonework and fragile stained glass windows, especially poses challenges resulting in extraordinary expenditures. Landmarking these structures only increase the cost of such restoration and adds to the daily operational costs of maintaining these properties. The use of special materials approved by LPC and the hiring of consultants, together with lengthy approvals, are required in order to make even routine improvements to these buildings. Landmark designation also detracts from the church's charitable and social mission by diverting funds away from the food pantries, immigration clinics, senior citizens, and other social services that are an essential part of every parish's work in all of our city's neighborhoods. Such designations are a serious burden which infringe on the ministry of the church. It is important to note that no public funding exists to offset the added expenses and burdens associated with landmarking, landmarking buildings or creating historic districts, which contain structures owned by religious organizations. The costly mandates and repairs imposed by landmarking must be borne exclusively by the church and its parishes, many of which have few, if any, financial resources. That is why we so strongly support the creation of a program that would authorize grants for this important purpose and thank Councilman Salamanca, Councilman Salamanca for introducing this measure as well as, for her, as well as his strong support in aligning with us in the opposition of designating Immaculate Conception as a landmark. We especially appreciate the inclusion of language in the bill stating that any grant program, quote, shall not discriminate against an organization on the basis of such organization's religious character or affiliation, end quote. It is our strong hope that this long overdue initiative will be passed by the council and that both the mayoral administration and the city council will provide this program with a sufficient funding stream to ensure its viability and success in helping to preserve New York City's architectural and historic legacy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, Chair Adams and Chair Salamanca. I'm Colleen Hemeyer speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy supports the goals of this legislation to allow the Landmarks Commission to provide grant funding to landmark religious properties, and we appreciate this interest in the issue from Council Member Salamanca. There is a long history of providing funds to New York City's religious, uh, religiously owned landmarks. Over 32 years, the Conservancy's Sacred Sites program has provided 480 grants totaling 4.6 million to 225 religious institutions. This has in turn funded $417 million in, in restoration projects. The New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation has an Environmental Protection Fund grant program, which provides religious landmarks matching grants of up to $500,000. A current grantee is the reformed Protestant Dutch Church of Flatbush. The borough presidents and city council have also provided capital funding for restoration projects, such as the exterior restoration of the Flushing Quaker Meeting House, which received <coughs> funds in 2008 from all three sources. However, we have major concerns with regard to implementation of this law. The Landmarks Preservation Commission has a grant program funded by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the proposed law is potentially in conflict with HUD fund funding guidelines. We understand that the Landmarks Commission has reached out to HUD for clarification of the guidelines, and we hope the Council's amendment is deferred until HUD responds to LPC's inquiry. We also have questions. Would this law change the LPC's existing grant program? It calls on the Commission not to, to discriminate but we have not seen evidence of discrimination just following funding guidelines. Are there plans to expand the grant program? This would be welcome news as the current grant program is small and oversubscribed. If passed, we hope that the council will allocate additional funding to assist eligible nonprofit and low income owners of landmark properties. Increased grants would be welcome for existing landmarks and good incentives when new designations are under consideration. We'd be happy to meet with, with council staff and LPC staff to discuss how this program could be expanded in the future. Thank you for the opportunity to express the Conservancy's views. Thank you very much for being here today. The, I'm sure that, and I appreciate your testimony, I'm sure that you're aware that um, this council is very progressive 
and we are looking to alleviate a lot of burden um, from our constituency in New York City. And I'm just curious to know, uh, per your testimony, Ms. Hemeyer, why exactly do you want or would you want the council to wait on voting on this bill? Well, in case it turns out that this would be in conflict with HUD's guidelines, would there be the potential then that LPC-funded religious properties would then have to um, <coughs> repay the money? And that would be a huge burden if the money in poor communities has already been spent. Okay, but given that and given um, given everything that is a part of this bill, I just find it a little uh, curious or a little unsettling that the council would wait on approving uh, or uh, on approving this particular uh, legislation. But I accept your your response, uh, Director Rosenberg. Uh, you, thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Do you know? Um, or have any personal knowledge of any religious institutions that may possibly take advantage of this grant? Well, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, and this goes, obviously, I represent the Archdiocese of New York and the Diocese of Brooklyn, but there are certainly synagogues and mosques and lots of churches that uh, very old structures that would uh, consider this to be a tremendous advantage if this was passed and sufficiently funded. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Chair Salamaka. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to put uh, five minutes on the clock and we're going to come to my colleagues for their questions as well. Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'll be very brief. Um, uh, Ms. Hemeyer, you, you support the goal of the legislation. Yes. And, and uh, I'm very grateful for the Conservancy's great work with uh, the money that it raises. Uh, to support landmarking and pres preservation of historic structures in New York. Um, I would echo the Chair's uh, comments regarding waiting for HUD. As you heard, uh, you were in the room, you heard earlier, I said, well, what happens if HUD never gets back to uh, LPC? And that's, you know, who knows? I mean, right? somebody gets a letter at HUD and they throw it in the garbage, they decide they're never going to get back. That's a realistic thing. It's possible. HUD is the government. It's, you know, it's in Washington. Things go in the garbage in Washington. So. The, the question that I have is, you know, as I described earlier, HUD's uh, regulations state, quote, faith-based organizations are eligible on the same basis as any other organization to participate in HUD programs and activities. That's from uh, federal regulations. Um, there seems to be no bar whatsoever uh, in HUD regulations other than a self-imposed ambiguity described by the Landmarks Preservation Commission, which in my humble estimation, uh, I don't believe exists. It's simply an ambiguity. Uh, so given the fact that HUD is very, uh, HUD's regulations are very clear that faith-based organizations are eligible to participate, why would you believe that it's necessary to wait for HUD to say, yes, we mean what we say in our regulations? Well, I can't answer to the LPC's uh, interpretation of guidance it has received or guidance it has, has read. Um, but again, we would appreciate that additional guidance, that additional confirmation from HUD, and <coughs> we would anticipate that HUD would respond. But we don't, as a city, we're a government, and uh, we all took an oath and to uphold in addition to our charter and our state constitution, the United States Constitution. So I would hope that you can trust us. I'm not asking you to lend me any money, but I would hope that you can trust us that we're not going to pass a law that is in conflict with the federal law. And as I've described, uh, HUD is pretty clear in its own regulations that there's no bar. So what you're asking is a prophylactic measure of an additional assurance by HUD telling us that, yes, what you read is right. We haven't changed our minds yet. Um, and I would just briefly like to read something that I think is, is important. I mean, I, I read this uh, probably 20 times in the last year. And uh, I always find it fascinating because it's such strong language. Um, if on account of my religious faith I am subjected to disqualifications from which others are free, I cannot but consider myself a persecuted man. An odious exclusion from any of the benefits common to the rest of my fellow citizens is a persecution. And that's from a Supreme Court decision issued last year, Trinity Lutheran Church 
where the court is very clear that a church can't be discriminated against. Now you said there's no uh, indication of discrimination, but as you know, LPC will not grant, uh, or will not award a grant to a religious house, house of worship. That is discrimination. It's may maybe they're not calling it discrimination, but they're saying everybody in New York City that's a nonprofit can apply for this grant and get it. Wait, church is not you. So that's discrimination, and it may not be the typical discrimination. It's not. Uh, it's not you know a separate water fountains discrimination. It's not segregated schools discrimination, but it's discriminating against a group of people based on the fact that they are observing religion and that they have a house of religion that they're asking. So what I would ask you to do is, uh, um, you know, I'm not asking you to sign on today and, and uh, throw a parade with us, but I would ask you to go back and look at this again and uh, along the goals that you say you support, which is to preserve houses of worship, which uh, your conservancy does do. And the ultimate goal of this council is to make sure that historic houses of worship in districts like Council Member Salamanca's in predominantly minority neighborhoods that are very old churches and in a lot of cases very old synagogues that have been repurposed over time for churches be preserved for the future of our children so that they can see what our city was and how we've built it. Thank you. Uh, something I'd like to add to that in terms of uh, <coughs> at least the uh, HUD funding issue. Um, although FEMA is certainly not HUD and our completely separate, different agency. Uh, just in January, the bipartisan budget agreement included a, an amendment to the Federal Disaster Act uh, that was passed by Congress, signed by the President, and supported by FEMA, which for the first time allowed houses of worship that are damaged due to natural disasters to be eligible for re rebuilding for FEMA repair funds. And uh, it's retroactive to August 2017, so it includes all the mosques, all the synagogues, all the churches that were badly damaged due to Hurricanes Maria, uh, Harvey, and Irma. So there is certainly a precedent here. I believe the FEMA funds might be CDBG. I'm not positive. But this is certainly not a pioneering mission here. And if FEMA has, and Congress has deemed it appropriate for funding to be used to help rebuild houses of worship that were the first responders to natural disasters. Certainly this is a similar issue that I suspect HUD would welcome. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from the panel? Okay, you may step down. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Are there any members of the public that wish to testify in this matter? Seeing none, I would like to thank the council and land use staff for preparing today's hearing and the members of the public and my colleagues for attending. This meeting is adjourned.